Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library's continuing online signature series of events. We reopened on Tuesday, June 1, and it was wonderful to see so many familiar faces in our libraries again. We look forward to the day when we can host our authors and patrons at signature events indoors. Tonight, we welcome a returning guest, Dr. Zachary Carabell. Educated at Columbia, Oxford, and Harvard, Dr. Carabell has written extensively on topics ranging from history to economics to international relations. His work has appeared in The Atlantic, Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times, among other publications. I hope you attended one of Dr. Carabell's previous events at KCPL. He's done three for us featuring these books, his biography of Chester Allen Arthur, the Leading Indicators, A Short History of the Numbers That Rule Our World, and Superfusion, How China and America Became One Economy and Why the World's Prosperity Depends on It. He joins us tonight for a discussion of his newest book, Inside Money, Brown Brothers Harriman and the American Way of Power. If you are interested in purchasing the book, and I hope you are, we encourage you to visit bookshop.org where your purchase will support independent booksellers across the country. Dr. Carable, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me tonight. And uh, hello to everyone in the ether. I know we're in this continual Zoom world. I imagine that by fall, would we do this? We would be able to do this in person, which would be a pleasure, but not today. So it'll just be a pleasure to talk online. So I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about my most recent book. I've been to the Kansas City Public Library a number of times over the past uh, 12 years, something like that. And I've always enjoyed being there and speaking with people and also really enjoying the, uh, the love of books. That was always such a palpable part of, of, of going there. So let me tell you a bit why I wrote this book and what the book's about and what I think some of the lessons are for the present. Uh, I've written a bunch of books and I've tended to look for stories that are that speak to our present, that allow a, an illumination of either how we became who we are or lessons for where we might go in the future um, and are also themselves rich, interesting stories about the past and again, how that past shapes our present. So many people, even within the financial world, have only a vague notion of what Brown Brothers Harriman was and an even vaguer notion of whether or not Brown Brothers Harriman still exists. And I, I think in many ways that fact is part of what makes writing this story so fascinating. Things that are obscure, of course, don't make great stories unless their obscurity is something that has, has been a hidden history that a book or a story can really bring to the fore. And in many ways, the story of Brown Brothers is the story of how money made America. It is the oldest investment firm, or now it's both an investment firm and a, and a private bank in the United States. And frankly, one of the oldest ongoing of such firms in the world. They say they were founded in 1818. I actually think the story begins in 1800 when the patriarch of the family, Alexander Brown, who was a linen merchant in Belfast, a Protestant linen merchant in Belfast, flees Ireland in one of the many bouts of sectarian violence. And he goes and sets up shop in Baltimore where a cousin of his had emigrated. Now, again, the story of an old firm is not necessarily a story worth telling. Living long may be a virtue, but it's not necessarily a narrative. What ends up happening though is that Brown Brothers becomes the driver of money in America in the 19th century. And then partly its partners become the driver of the global economic system in the 20th. So the story, the arc of the story is how did money make America in the 19th century? How did the men, and they were all men, how did the men who made money in the 19th century make the world in the 20th century? Because in many ways, the global system that we still live in today a world of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations, a world dominated by the dollar as the currency of last resort and the, and the currency everyone uses to trade goods and services, including the Chinese. 
a world of the Pentagon and the National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency, a world of American foreign aid, starting with the Marshall Plan. All of that was architected by a group that we once called the establishment, uh, of which Brown Brothers was central and core. And if anyone is aware of Brown Brothers, it's often because they are aware of one of its more illustrious, famous, infamous, depends on your perspective, partners, who was Prescott Bush, who was a senator from Connecticut from 1952 to 1960, a Brown Brothers partner who made a considerable amount of money doing that, and of course is the patriarch of the Bush dynasty, the father of George Herbert Walker Bush and the grandfather of George W. Bush. So people are certainly aware of the Bush family, even if they're not aware of Brown Brothers as the source of the Bush family's wealth and social standing, and in many ways, what allows them to become the political dynasty that they did. So I, I wrote the book to illuminate those themes, not to illuminate the Bush family per se, but to illuminate the themes of how money made America. And when I began the book, I was quite aware of that period in the mid 20th century when a series of Brown Brothers partners including Prescott Bush, including Averill Harriman, and also especially a man named Robert Lovett, who served as first assistant secretary of war during World War II, one of the creators of the modern Air Force, and then as undersecretary of state to George Marshall, and then as undersecretary of defense and finally secretary of defense during the Korean War. So I knew that story. I, I wasn't as aware of just how important and dramatic Brown Brothers Harriman was to the arc of the of the American economy in the 19th century, nor was I aware of what they have become today, because they do still exist. And even though most people don't know they exist, they still have 5,000 employees, they have $2 billion in revenue, they have $500 million in profit spread amongst 30 some odd partners and with a very generous plan of profit sharing for employees. And the fact that a firm of that size, which does modest business, relative to JP Morgan or you know Google. Uh, but the fact that we're not as aware of that because it's not what we either laud or vilify is itself part of the story of what capitalism has become versus what capitalism used to be and what Brown Brothers Harriman itself defined capitalism as in an er earlier era. So one of the arcs of the story is that the capitalism most evident in the past 40 years which is a capitalism of shareholders using essentially other people's money um, in order to maximize profitability, regardless of the societal costs, because the societal costs are not part of the, the, the mandate of a company. That's a capitalism of the 1980s, 1990s, and into the aughts and the present. It's not necessarily what capitalism has to be. It's what capitalism became over time. And one of the stories of Brown Brothers is alternate forms of capitalism that predominated or proliferated throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries with a culture that would not have agreed with that culture. So in many ways, from the time of Alexander Brown to the present, Brown Brothers was imbued with a series of values and ethics, many of which were laid out by Alexander Brown himself to his four sons his four sons who become the Brown brothers. And each of them are trained in this business, which begins as a linen importer from Ireland and soon morphs into a multifaceted trading empire. He writes a series of letters to his children over the 20 or 30 years of the beginning of the 19th century with uh, a series of homilies and, and adages that were very much like poor Richard's almanac or what Polonius might have said to Hamlet, uh, things like trust is easily lost and hard to gain, uh, be ever attentive to risks because you know those can always come up and be prepared for struggle. In a time of uncertainty, don't take undue speculative opportunities, you know, save those for another day. Uh, and also he used to use this phrase, shoemaker stick to thy last, as a way of saying, do what you do, do it well, do it repeatedly. Don't diversify into a gazillion different businesses, but really focus on your core competencies. Uh, and above all, 
be attentive to the world around you because you're embedded in a community. And that set of principles over generations is never deviated from. You know, Brown Brothers ends up being at the epicenter of every important vital moment in 19th and 20th century, not just economic history in the United States, but major turning points. They are present at the birth of the railroads and help create the first railroad in the, in, in the form of Baltimore's uh, B&O Railroad, which begins in 1828, which is the first passenger railroad in the United States, the first steam drawn engine powered railroad anywhere in the world and ushers in the railroad revolution and is funded by Brown Brothers. But it's funded by Brown Brothers in 1828, not so they can make money, but it's funded by Alexander and his sons because they were legitimately worried in 1828 that Baltimore was about to be economically eclipsed by New York, which was benefiting from its natural advantages in its harbor, and even more from the opening of the Erie Canal connecting New York much more easily in terms of transport to the Ohio River Valley. And Philadelphia, which was kind of second fiddle to New York, was also building a, a canal over the Susquehanna into the Ohio River Valley. And Baltimore was legitimately concerned that it was about to be eclipsed. And so the city fathers led by Alexander Brown decide to pay for this hugely speculative, untested technology that was going to restore or at least allow Baltimore to remain competitive, a railroad called the b &O. And it fails. I mean, the, the railroad gets constructed, but Baltimore does not become competitive with New York. It gets eclipsed. And the only reason why Alexander and his sons fund the construction of this railroad is out of a public service notion of if the community in which you are embedded isn't thriving, then no private industry or private individual will ultimately be able to thrive. That, that private gain and public good are ultimately inextricably linked and inseparable. And so they fund this huge public works project and so do the city fathers of Baltimore, so do many of Baltimore citizens who buy individual shares in this new venture because they think it's necessary for the public good and they think the public good is necessary for their private gain. And that sets up, I think, a template that's really vital, which is a firm that, that believed and practiced and preached this ethos of you, you have to serve the public good in order to serve your private good. Now, many people today find that either astonishing or hypocritical or unbelievable. And I think the, the, the challenge is to recognize that human beings are complicated and messy, that it's not one or the other, that you can be serving and self-serving. You can be self-serving and of service. You can be selfish and selfless. You can pursue your private gain and also attend to the public good. And that all those things, even if they can be contradictory, do not cancel each other out. That human beings are a messy mix of contradictory impulses and they will they can pursue those but the capitalism that brown brothers creates in the 19th and into the 20th century was a capitalism that was much more intimately aware of the connection between private gain and the public good and the need for those who have benefited greatly from a system to give back to the public good that the the, the sort of mantra of with great power comes great responsibility and the partners and the family and the fathers and sons and fathers and sons into the 20th century, and then their non-family successors in the firm really believed that and lived it in a way that I think is in quite stark contrast with the present. And when I make that stark contrast with the present, it's not from a romanticization of the past. I don't think we want to go back to a world dominated by a, an exclusive, closed um, elite who really, you know, by class, by gender, by education, by temperament, by religion, were, a, were an exclusive club that most people could never be a part of. But that exclusive club, that self-conscious elite that becomes the establishment of the 20th century, of which Brown Brothers is a card-carrying member, a founding card-carrying member, uh, did believe in the connection between their private gain and the public and ultimately believe that they are bound to serve, that they're called to serve the public. That really becomes more true in the 20th century than it was in the 19th. And the other thing they do in the 19th century that's rather extraordinary 
is they create a lot of the initial paper money system that undergirds the US economy in a way that makes the US very distinct from the rest of the world. The rest of the world was mostly illiquid. Wealth was bound up in land, in people, in gold and silver. And it was hard to get liquid money to do something which made change difficult or innovation challenging. In the United States in the 19th century, if you had a hope and a dream, there were all these wildcat banks, there was different states, there was a lot of paper promises and it was fairly easy to make a fortune or lose a fortune, which is something Alexis de Tocqueville remarked. And we all have to continue to quote Alexis de Tocqueville because it gives otherwise commonplace observation some kind of aura of authority. But the liquidity of the United States in the 19th century was a massive advantage. It also created incredible volatility. And Brown Brothers uses and innovates these things called letters of credit, which are fairly arcane, but without which there can be no uh, volume of international trade. Because the, the challenge from time immemorial in trade is that if you're someone who wants to sell something to someone far away, you want to know that if you sell your goods, you're going to get paid. And the person on the other end wants to know that if they're going to pay, they're going to get the goods. So how do you solve for that conundrum? You need intermediaries and Brown Brothers becomes them who essentially promise payment on both promise payment and delivery on both sides and take a little bit of risk onto their own balance sheet to make sure that every side knows and trusts that the, that the transaction will be complete at a price that's acceptable. And they use these things called letters of credit to lubricate and guarantee the process. And by the 1830s, they are one of the largest underwriters of all transatlantic trade, including the cotton trade, which they are a major player in, which means that the Brown family before the Civil War was also deeply complicit in the slave system as a merchant of cotton, as an underwriter of transatlantic trade from New York to Liverpool, from Mobile, you know, cotton from Mobile or New Orleans into Baltimore, into New York and across the ocean to Liverpool. Uh, they were also simultaneously deeply anti-slavery. And to be complicit in a system and to hate the system and complicit in the system was one of the contradictions that I think was true of a lot of Northerners who understood certainly by the 1850s that one of the reasons that Lincoln talks about you can't be half slave and half free is because anybody in the United States who was making money was complicit in slavery in those years. And you know, the Browns were that, right? It just was the way it was. They were complicit in an immoral system, profiting from it, and, and there you had it. Um, but they are vital to the evolution of the American economy and vital to the evolution of paper money, paper credit, that allows the United States to really break away economically uh, in the 19th century relative to the rest of the world. So think of Brown Brothers in the 19th century a little bit like Zelig, that old movie where the character is a chameleon and seems to be present at multiple junctures, multiple important junctures. The, the point of Zelig is that you know he morphs and he's always present. In many ways, I thought about Brown Brothers in the 19th century as at every important juncture, the railroads, the transatlantic shipping lines, the cotton trade, um, the evolution of paper credit, the evolution of travelers' credits, and all these things, there's a Brown Brothers banker in the second row back left looking like a banker, not wanting to be the story, but without whom there is no story. And in many ways, generations of Browns shunned the spotlight. They, they didn't want to be in the forefront. They wanted to be in the background, quietly supporting the business of others and making money in the process. And that's exactly what they did. What was also fascinating is that they, um, in many ways, don't participate in the railroad boom of the late 19th century because it was too speculative. It was too um, risky. That was another one of Alexander Brown's kind of constant, ongoing, never ending mantras, which is don't expose yourself to risks you can't afford. And, and that capitalism is kind of absent today. And it's absent today because the, the, the structures of reward are different when it's shareholder capitalism versus partnership capitalism. Every single deal that Brown Brothers does risks the partner's capital. Every single deal they do, they had to consider that they could lose all the money they put into it, which is totally contrary to shareholder capitalism of today or the late 20th century, where someone like Tim Cook or a, or a private equity firm 
the individuals running that and, the, and some of the shareholders of that, they could make $100 million. Uh, they're never going to personally lose $100 million, even if the company does. And if the company does and it gets bad enough, they'll either, the shareholders will either absorb the losses or eventually government money. For a partnership like Brown Brothers, and this was true of a lot of financial firms into the 20th century, they could make a million dollars and they could also lose a million dollars. And it was their skin in the game and it was their risk. And that changed the equation of speculation versus risk, or at least it did for Brown Brothers. And at least that's why they're able to survive and thrive for as long as they do. And it's why they, they kind of steer clear of a lot of the, the massive transcontinental railroad boom of the late 19th century, because the fact is we remember the people who made huge money in those years, the, the JP Morgans and the Carnegie's and the Frick's. Uh, but for every one of them, there are hundreds, if not thousands who lost everything. Most of the people who make money during the railroad boom make money by buying the bonds that built the railroads that then go bust. They themselves are not the ones building the railroads. And one of the ones who makes a lot of money in these years is a railroad baron named E.H. Harriman who comes on somewhat late in the scene and is part of that whole group that tries to kind of uh, control the entire railroad network of the United States and the Northern Securities Trust, which was formed with JP Morgan and, and Hill and a whole bunch of others, uh, and tries to unite the Union Pacific and a few other lines, including the Central Illinois. And E.H. Harriman ends up losing out as one of the only trusts that Teddy Roosevelt breaks up, another New Yorker like E.H. Harriman. Uh, but he creates a fortune that his son Averill inherits. And in the 19 teens, Averill Harriman and his younger brother Roland are in college. They're at Yale. And they're at Yale with a lot of the children and younger partners of Brown Brothers. And this is what begins this notion that there's a small, cohesive, closed, cosseted group of elites that are bound together by the same schools the Grottons and the Lawrencevilles, the same colleges, the Yales and the Harvards, the same secret or senior societies like Skull and Bones, the same class, the same boards, the same social community. And in many ways, that's an accurate picture. They were a small closed elite. Uh, they were part of what, when Henry Luce talks about the birth of the American century at the, at the dawn of the 1940s, that the 20th century was gonna be an American century powered by American capital and American might. Uh, Henry Luce, also a Yale grad, also funded by Brown Brothers and Harriman. Um, they were talking about the creation of this cohesive group that really did see themselves as bound to lead and bound to serve. And they embody that public service ethos that says, okay, we've been granted great fortune or we've earned great fortune, or in the case of Harriman, we've inherited great fortune. What are we going to do with it? What's the world that we are going to make with this money? And the end of World War II becomes the opportunity to shape that world, to make that world. And they do. They, a few of them enter government, Harriman, absolutely. Then Robert Lovett, who had been a Yale grad, who had been the son of the man who manages the Harriman Railroad Empire, Prescott Bush, who I talked about before. Uh, and the three of them enter ever higher levels of government and in many ways become part of that coterie, which included people like Dean Acheson, another Yale grad who was connected to the Harrimans and connected to the Brown brothers. And they construct a world. They take a formula that had worked for them in the United States, that if the commons don't thrive, private industry can't thrive, the capitalism is the best form of economic arrangements that it leads to greater prosperity, greater stability, um, and, and they were going to be the ones steering that particular ship. And therefore they write the rules of the global economic system. And in many ways, the rules of the global international order. The, and the Marshall plan is the perfect iteration of this, which is we're going to spend money to rebuild Western Europe in order for Western Europe, a, not to fall to communism, not to descend into chaos that led to the rise of fascism between the two world wars and also so that they thrive enough so that we thrive, so the capitalism thrives. And it's that perfect kind of either virtuous or, or not so circle of interest and self-interest, interest and self-interest. And that is the Brown Brothers formula of we're gonna serve the public good, the public good's gonna serve us.
We're going to go into government service. We're going to design an economic system globally that has worked for the United States nationally. We're going to replace the British pound with the US dollar, and that's going to become the medium of exchange for the rest of the world for the rest of the century. Uh, and it's a winning formula until it isn't, until Americans themselves react against it, until young Americans in the 1960s and 1970s who believed that that class, that establishment, had led the United States into a disastrous war in Vietnam, had enriched itself and beggared you know, many of the, the working class and also had ignored years of racial injustice. And so there's a very strong reaction against the Brown brothers of the world and a belief that they had basically called the shots in a selfish, destructive fashion. What's interesting is that Brown Brothers keeps going throughout this time. And when all these other companies start going public in the 80s, they don't. They remain a private partnership. And that means in many ways they are eclipsed. And in many ways, the kind of capitalism that they preached, um, you know, be aware of the risks, be aware of the dangers, be mindful, be of service, and also profit hugely for yourself, that capitalism disappears from the stage and is replaced by the capitalism we're familiar with today, which is how much can you get, how quickly? Enough is never enough. How do I get more? And that's done at a corporate level and it's done at an individual level. And, and the way I, I think about it in the book is um, those elites, at, as hierarchical and exclusive as they were, nonetheless created a system that was much more economically equitable by the 1950s, where the average differential between a worker and a CEO was about 30 to one. And even though that WASP elite were, were un, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't enter it if you weren't born into it or you didn't go to the right schools, they nonetheless created a more egalitarian system than the more meritocratic capitalism of today that sees the average differential between a worker and a CEO at like 300 to one, that sees an indifference on the part of tech elites to shaping the public debate in a way in which if, as Dean Acheson said, the Brown Brothers group were present at the creation of the global system in the late 1940s and were in the muck of trying to figure out how should we shape society for the benefit of the most and not just the few, tech elites today are absent at the creation. And it means that all this regulation and all the power and all the money that have accrued to those sectors, particularly after the pandemic, um, they, are, they are oddly enough not engaged in the public debate about privacy and technology and profit uh, in a way that has led that to one of the only unifying themes in public life these days. One of the only things that you could get Tom Cotton and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Josh Hawley to agree about is that big technology companies have too much wealth, too much power, and too much control, and that the elites and the, the runners of those companies are absent or indifferent. And I, I find that contrast fascinating and disturbing in that the idea that you can detach yourself from society and, and accrue huge benefits uh, is a very problematic one and not one that I think is sustainable over time. Whereas the Brown Brothers notion of capitalism was one that was much more closely tethered to the public good and the recognition that you have to engage that public in order to you know, constructively be a part of the world that we're in. And I think they live that, and I, and I think that that's a, a vital element uh, that's missing in the world today. The point isn't to go back, right? Again, I'm not romanticizing that period of time. I'm suggesting that that ethos is a vital ingredient to a more sustainable capitalism, that it would shape the tech industry differently and the financial industry uh, leading up to the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, that having that would be more, um, would be a more holistic capitalism that's more connected to how is everyone doing and not just how are we doing, more connected to a long-term prosperity and not just a quarterly or short-term one, and uh, one that would be more constructive for society going forward. It's a, it's a lesson for the present that leaders of the tech industry and leaders of larger companies, some of which I do think get this, could embrace to our advantage and their advantage. It's not about going back, it's about going forward. So that's why I told the story of Brown Brothers, to paint this picture of how we became who we are, how American capitalism evolved and then potentially, I guess, devolved 
uh, and how this one firm helped define the world of money and the global systems that money both dictated and shaped in the 20th century in a way that is the world we are still living in. And I hope you'll take a look at the book and read it. There's a lot more there than I can condense in, in 30 minutes, of course. Um, and think about these questions and think about this overall question of, is the capitalism we are in the only one we could have? And are there other paths that are more constructive for the world going forward? So I think we have some questions, but maybe you want to feed those to me. We do, Dr. Carabo. People have been thinking about this and there have been a couple of questions show up in the chat. So to start with, um, uh, we have a question, how does BBH maintain its more careful risk averse approach today, um, keeping today's ethos from affecting the thinking and strategies of its leadership? You know, I mean, it's a good question. I think a lot of it just has to do with the intent of the people who have run the firm for, you know, in many ways, centuries, even though the family is no longer running the firm. Um, that they have that, like that line, shoemaker stick to thy last. They have, they have stuck to their principles and they have stuck to their ethos in a way that's rather extraordinary. It's extraordinary because so few firms do that. It's extraordinary that there have been so few black sheep over the years in Brown Brothers, you know, no wayward heir, uh, no partners who were secretly had a gambling addiction. I mean, if they had those black sheep, they've done a really good job covering them up. And I went through the archives pretty carefully. It's possible, but there was no hint of it. Um, and so it's a real, it's a real set of culture and conviction. And I think that's important when we think about how would that be applied today? I don't, I don't think you can regulate your way to a, a constructive culture. You can regulate bad behavior. But I don't think you can regulate good behavior and, and, and constructive culture. Yeah, that has to be a choice that you make individually. It's a choice a company makes. It's a choice we make in our communities. And in many ways, it's a choice that Brown Brothers made over time, not without flaws. Again, they were exclusive. Sometimes they're anti-Semitic. They were in slavery. They helped generate American imperialism in the early part of the 20th century, all these things. Um, but on balance, they were more connected to the overall society and they've remained so. You know, the work they do now is necessary work in the financial system, but it's not glamorous work. They're not investment bankers. They don't do big deals. Uh, they do a lot of things that need doing for modest fees that serve their clients. And they've purposely not gotten huge or not even tried to get huge because they're not interested in being huge. And this idea of like, when is enough enough? They are satisfied with doing that. And they make a lot of money. The fact that we don't either appreciate that or recognize it as part of kind of the contemporary problem of why do we lionize even those that we demonize? Why are the Michael Milkins and the Wolf of Wall Street and the, the people and the Lehman brothers, why do those garner the attention? Negative attention, but attention. And part of what I try to show in the book is we should pay more attention to the things we pay less attention to, because sometimes they're more vital to the system. Um, and, and, and the final point in that is you don't want a system composed only of Brown Brothers ethos. You do want some risk. You do want innovation. You do want people to, to go, go with a hope and a dream that's untested that might lose money. But you don't want that ethos at the center of the financial system. You want it to be peripheral. I think at the core, you want people who are mindful that money can destroy, even though money can create. The money is power. It's quicksilver power contained in the atom and you better respect it. And Brown Brothers always respected that you could wake up tomorrow and the world could be changed. You could wake up tomorrow and there could be a pandemic. And the time to be prepared for that is now, not tomorrow. And that every night when you go to bed, you should be prepared for the world to have changed and changed badly. And that's what they live by and that's what they live by now. And I think that's a constructive caution, small c conservatism in a financial world that is too enamored with the huge outsized gains. And that's how they've done it. This is a fascinating family and their, their history and their, their business practices. I, uh, I was doing just a little uh, research and I wanted to ask, did, did Brown Brothers Har Harriman have any connection to the business plot of 19, 
33, that political conspiracy that popped up in relation to a review of your book. And I thought, yeah, I mean, look, they, uh, there was a business spot. It was a bunch of business leaders who, uh, (laughs) got together and contacted Smedley, Smedley Butler. Now Smedley (laughs) Butler was a general of the, uh, a Marine and had led the, the U S Marines to occupy Nicaragua in 1912, largely in order to protect loans that Brown brothers had made to the Nicaraguan government. So the United States ends up occupying and staying in Nicaragua much on the behalf of Brown Brothers. Smedley Butler is then approached by a group of businessmen in 1933 uh, who want to overthrow Roosevelt. I think one of whom reaches out to Roland Harriman, who's Avril Harriman's younger brother and ran Harriman and Sons. That has led to this kind of, I think, odd conspiracy story that Brown Brothers was supporting the business plot, um, which was not much of a plot. It was really a bunch of like, drunken rich wall street guys getting together in a club in new york and you know spinning dark tales that they were somehow going to overthrow fdr um but it really didn't leave you know drunken nights in a in a gentleman's club i mean not a gentleman's club the way we think of them now in an actual club in new york city with a library and you know people doing brandy (laughs) snifters so you know they reached out to roland Uh, and maybe to others, but that doesn't mean the Brown brothers either supported it or that Roland took the bait. There's no evidence of that at all. I I thought that's a really interesting factoid. I wanted to ask Dr. Carable about that. We have a couple of other questions here in the chat. Um, Let's see. Oh, um, from one of our viewers, as we hold institutions and individuals to account for injustices of the past, how much, if at all, should we care today about BBH's involvement in the cotton trade and complicity in slavery? Look, I think we should care quite a bit about their involvement in the sense of what does it tell us? You know, what I said before, I, I, I believe that if partly why the United States can't be half free and half slave in Lincoln's words in the 19, 1850s was the awareness, the growing awareness amongst many people in the North that even if you hated slavery, you lived in a slave system that the U.S. economy, circa 1850, was a slave economy, even if you were in the North and hated slavery. The amount of money cotton generated, the amount of money the North made and then reinvested in industry from the cotton trade or from the transatlantic trade that itself was largely underpinned by cotton, um, made the entire system complicit in slavery. And Brown Brothers was even more so as a merchant facilitating this trade. And I think that's what we need to look at. You know, it's not like, oh, there were a few firms and they were, you know, immoral because they did it. It's the whole system was immoral because it was part of it. And and that I think was part of the increasing moral imperative that generates the civil war that animates the creation of the Republican party, which Brown Brothers support fully. Um, and remember, Brown Brothers had, had, was a major presence in Liverpool, and the son of Alexander Brown, William Brown, was a member of Parliament. Uh, and Brown Shipley ends up becoming they, they were named Brown Shipley in, in Liverpool, really important in UK finances. Opposing the cotton trade or, or the Civil War itself, when that broke out, there were a lot of people in England and a lot of the merchant class who wanted to recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation because um, the, the supply of cotton was jeopardized by the Northern and Lincoln's blockade of the South. You know, the the United Kingdom was adamantly anti-slavery. They had outlawed slavery long before the United States. Even so, they were prepared to recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation just because they needed cotton for the mills in Birmingham and and Manchester and elsewhere. So opposing slavery and supporting the war on the part of Brown Brothers was potentially jeopardized their own franchise because of difficult relations with England at the time. And yet, you know, they were unequivocal about that. Does that answer the question, do you think? I think so. Um, We'll hear about it in the chat if it does not. But in the meantime, here's another one that just came in. Uh, What was BBH's role in the start of the foreign exchange market and what are they doing today? Yeah, so I mean, Brown Brothers basically creates a system of foreign exchange when there was none. There was no public foreign exchange rates, currencies didn't float. If you wanted to know what a pound was worth in terms of dollars or dollars and pounds, it really had to do with what people were paying for the same products at the same time in different parts of the world. And for that, you needed intelligence and you needed systems that compared them and contrasted them. And Brown Brothers essentially becomes a repository of information uh, 
about pounds and dollars because they were doing so much business buying cotton in pounds and selling, sorry, buying cotton in dollars and selling them in Liverpool in pounds. And then, and so they become kind of the, the first creators of a foreign exchange system and foreign exchange rates. Other firms, other traders, other banks look to them to determine what the exchange rate was. Uh, and that remained part of their franchise for much of the 19th century. Some of that changes went with the invention of the telegraph when it became easier to figure out in more real time who was buying what and for what amount. But even today, one of Brown Brothers franchises is, again, this is a somewhat arcane thing. They settle, if you buy at, in your Schwab account, a foreign listed company that trades on a US exchange, and it's called an ADR, an American depository receipt, someone has to harmonize the price of that in its home market versus the price of that in dollars. And even though that's all done electronically, um, Brown Brothers has a specialty in being able to do this from their literally, you know, century plus of knowing how foreign exchange markets work. We're going to close with one more question for you. Um, what characteristics or values do you think future businesses should take moving forward from BBH? I think one, this idea of when is enough enough, like really asking, is the imperative to make more always a good imperative? You know, when is it not a good imperative? When is the structural imperative destructive for the, for the greater society? And certainly there are way too many firms whose sole goal is more, 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 irrespective of the consequences for the larger society. And it's really interesting, even E.H. Harriman, Ned Harriman, who really was a, a railroad baron and was much more aggressive and ambitious and kind of a different type of person than the Browns, even though his son Averill was much more like them, you know, the next generation. When he takes over the railroads, unlike a private equity company of today, which basically takes over a distressed asset and tries to eke out as much profit by cutting costs, Harriman took over these distressed railroads in the 1890s, like the Union Pacific, and spends a huge amount of money to upgrade them in the belief that the investment will then be the source of future income, which is a totally different model than I'm going to cut costs in order to generate profits. So, you know, the idea of getting more and more and more, regardless of the costs on other people or other parts of society is, is not always a healthy one. And it's certainly one that Brown Brothers Harriman would have abjured, as well as this idea of you cannot beggar the commons endlessly. I mean, you might be able to individually, but you cannot have a sustainable capitalism over time where a few people benefit enormously and the rest don't benefit proportionally. And that you owe a responsibility to that public good, one, because you just do, because it's the right thing, and two, because it's what forms a sustainable constructive feedback loop where your own interests are served because you're serving the interests of the many. And I think Brown Brothers lived that ethos. Um, and, and, and I think even if they, in many times they failed that ethos, that is an ethos that we should live and that we should embrace today. And I think that's one of the most important lessons of the firm over time. Thank you so much, Dr. Carable, for spending your evening with us. And folks, if you're interested in ordering a copy of Inside Money, Brown Brothers Harriman and American Way of Power, please order from bookshop.org. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Carable, for sharing your expertise with us this evening. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And please buy the book. Father's Day is coming up. It's a good gift. It is. <laughs>